thanks so much for the opportunity to spend some time with you um, today. This is really a, a marvelous opportunity. I'm honored to be able to share some thinking around this idea of authentic leadership, uh, the three steps, as we're calling it, to becoming an authentic leader. You saw in the, uh, in the brief that was on the website that we have some outcomes for today's uh, discussions. I'll walk through as quickly as uh, and reasonably as I can the, the notions that we have around this and then try to leave plenty of time for questions and answers because I think that's sometimes the more meaty part of, uh, of the discussion. But what I have in mind to share with you today um, is how authentic leadership ties directly to the bottom line. And I'm using the word bottom line there pretty generally. That could be profitability or it could be any other measure of success for your organization. Uh, why it's a valuable tool, how to apply something we're calling the authentic leadership framework, and uh, show you at least how to apply one component of that. To accomplish those goals, I thought we'd start right off with a discussion of authentic leadership and success, uh, put some definitions around authentic leadership, and then, um, as promised, talk about those three particular steps. The motivation for this whole topic of authentic leadership in our work really comes from that old um, ch children's story by Hans Christian Andersen, The Emperor's New Clothes. Maybe you're familiar with the story. I'll just paraphrase it really quickly. If you're not, I would encourage you to look it up. It's really uh, quite comical and at the same time quite sad about the emperor who thinks so much of himself and is uh, confronted one day by a tailor who weaves very special threads that only the most important people can see read to a whole suit of clothing made out of this uh, very special and very expensive thread. And of course, as the story progresses, we find out that it's a, a scam, that there in fact is no thread, and the emperor in fact has no clothes on. But the people around him don't want to tell him that uh, because they think he's so enchanted uh, with his high position and this rare opportunity to have this rare clothing. And it's only when a little child comes along and sort of burst the uh, the bubble that the emperor realizes that in fact he is not clothed at all. And if we're not careful as leaders, we can find ourselves in a very similar position. I think the uh, the notion that the the work that we do, the the uh, positions that we aspire to and attain, sometimes can cloud our judgment. In our work, we're finding that people more and more are in, are craving. Uh, what's become known popularly as authentic leaders. And I'm wholeheartedly in support of that notion, but it's very important for me to be able to tie authentic leadership to something that's real in the organization, not just have it be a philosophical uh, discussion, but in fact be able to make some connection between authenticity, leadership, and success. So as we started to look around in this area and do some research, there was a really interesting thread that began to pop up. And it's this thread, that engaged people deliver superior results. That's pretty well known. Lots of organizations around the world, and I'll give you some, some quotes here in just a couple of moments. Lots of folks have, uh, have been able to describe the power of an engaged workforce. We also found in our research of that work that there was an interesting thread of the role of the manager and leader in engaging the workforce. And then finally, the notion that engaged leaders produce the best and most engaged people. So our logic, or our thread, if you will, is that engaged people deliver superior results. The research there is clear. We're suggesting to you that authentic leadership, as we're going to describe it in a little while, fully engages people. And those success, then, requires authentic leaders to fully engage people. Let's take a quick look at some of the research around this. Probably the most notable researcher in the area of leadership engagement, or uh, uh, people engagement, excuse me, is the Gallup organization. And their most recent worldwide uh, study shows that just 13% of the employees were engaged at work. Here's a comparative uh, between their uh, research in 2009 and 2010 and the most recent 11 and 12 research. You'll notice the engaged workforce down at the bottom has actually gone from 11 to 13 percent. Although that's a nice increase, it's still certainly a dismal number when we think about all of the work and success that our organizations need to generate. The not engaged, sort of the mildly, you know, sort of showing up for work but not really committed to the work of the organization, 
is in that 62 to 63 percent range. Uh, what I'm really troubled by is the group of people, that 27 to 24 percent, depending on which study year you look at, that are actively disengaged, actively undermining, if you will, uh, the work of the organization. Other researchers find the very same thing. In fact, I just read on the Harvard Business Review blog that uh, the notion of engaged uh, employees and the power that leaders have in that particular area. Bill George is sort of the, uh, the creator, I think, of this notion of authentic leadership. And he talks about uh, how important authentic leadership is to sustaining results in good and bad time. And even the Hay Group uh, talks in some of their most recent research uh, about the challenge of engaging the good, reliable people in an organization um, in a more productive way. Their uh, research is interesting because it points out that the, uh, the hearts and minds of the stars of your organization, those people that are considered to be high potential and high performing, um, are in fact already engaged. But how do you engage the rest of the workforce? So again, this thread for us comes up. And we think, well, if engaged people, in fact, do deliver better results, and if authentic leaders, uh, as again, I'll describe those to you in just a moment, are the best way to fully engage people, then the future success in our organization is going to be dependent upon all of us who find ourselves in leadership roles uh, acting and behaving in a way that is authentic. Again, the, the challenge is that those are lofty terms. Authentic leadership is a huge subject and would have a wide range of meanings. and would be maybe something like looking out at the night sky and seeing the myriad of stars and uh, remarking about how beautiful they are, but not really knowing how they might go together, unless you have some sort of a map, some sort of a way of cataloging the various constellations. Now, I'm not trying to suggest that authentic leadership is as difficult is as challenging as astronomy. But nonetheless, uh, we have to be able to narrow down our views of what it means to be an authentic leader. And again, there's lots of definitions out there. I'm going to share with you ours. But you may, in fact, find that you want to embrace a, a different one. So as we narrow this down, as we, if you will, begin to put some constraints around our constellation of authentic leadership, here is the working definition that we're crafting. That authentic leadership is the passion and capability to transparently engage, motivate, and move people toward achieving shared goals. Now, let me just give you a couple of thoughts about those words and what we mean. Again, I'll say more about the underlying framework of authentic leadership in just a moment. Uh, but the first word that really I want to spend a moment or two on is the notion of passion. Uh, my work over the last 16 years has been in helping develop leaders in organizations across a myriad of types of industries in different parts of the world. And sometimes I'm called in to work with a high potential leader, uh, somebody who is an up and comer, so to speak, in the organization. And sometimes I'm called into organizations where the leaders um, are, are having trouble, uh, that they've, uh, they've gotten themselves into a bit of a, a challenge with their teams for whatever reason, from a leadership perspective. And the first question I always ask those folks whether they're the high potentials or the ones that are in trouble, is do you want to lead? And it's interesting, a significant percentage of those people will say no. And, and, and my sense, my experience, and certainly some of the research that we've done, tells me that unless you're passionate about working with people, who by the way are very difficult, uh, they don't always go in straight lines, they kind of messy, um, then you probably don't want to find yourself in a leadership role. So uh, one of the things that I think is really important for an authentic leader is that they're passionate about people. And I mean passion in the highest possible sense, not romance, certainly. But I'm talking about um, the, the inquisitiveness, the curiosity, the fascination, uh, the joy, if you will, of working uh, with people. So there's the, the drive part of our definition. The second part, second word, is capability. I really do believe that uh, authentic leadership is something that can be learned. I'll talk about the character pieces of it in a moment, but um, it's both a drive or a passion or a, a, a motivation and a capability. And then it's transparent. I don't think there's any other way to talk about the subject of authentic leadership than to say 
that um, it will be a little bit like the emperor's new clothes. We're going to have to be willing to be, I guess, um, uncovered. And again, I mean that in the best possible sense. Uh, we have to be open uh, and transparent to, to followers. Interestingly enough, that's really what they crave is uh, that sort of transparency. And then the, the rest of it's fairly classic. You know, they have to be able to motivate and move people toward achieving those shared goals. So it's a, it's a high bar definition intended to be just that, a way of uh, challenging each of us who find ourselves in leadership roles. Now, let me tell you what I think authentic leadership is not. And, and this is to distinguish it from lots of things that are out there and available to leaders on a day-to-day -day basis. Authentic leadership is not just a set of tips and tricks. Uh, leadership is, from my perspective, a lifelong pursuit to, to grow your capabilities as a leader um, is not just something that gets boiled down into um, you know, the seven things that are absolute musts or something like that, even though I'm going to give you three, three steps. I guess I'm in that same boat to some extent. But it's not tips and tricks. It is also not being perfect. Uh, authentic leaders are not perfect. In fact, in fact, maybe just the opposite. They are comfortable with what their strengths are and what their weaknesses are, and they're comfortable with the followers, the people on their team, understanding those. Authentic leadership is a matter of the heart. Quite frankly, you can't just copy somebody else. You'll have to uh, develop this uh, authentic leadership on your own. And one of the things that's really interesting, and this pops out of the research from Gallup and others, and it's, uh, it's also contained in that um, Harvard Business Review blog post that I just mentioned a few moments ago, that uh, authentic leadership is not just a series of highly uh, orchestrated or coordinated engagement programs for employees. One of the things that we watch leaders do too often is um, try to dish off to HR or some other part of the organization the responsibility that really is theirs alone. If you want to engage the workforce, you certainly could use some programs and some things that HR department might be able to dispense for you, but you'll have to take responsibility for engaging your employees because really what engages employees is authentic leadership. So that gives us some rounding now, if you will, about what we mean when we, when we say authentic leadership. We're talking about uh, that passion, that capability to transparently engage, motivate, and move people toward achieving shared goals. We're not talking about just a list of tips and tricks. We're not talking about perfection. We're not talking about copying other people. Um, and we're not talking about just a series of engagement programs uh, to try and uh, trick people into giving their hearts and their minds to the organization. So with that definition, let's narrow it just a little bit more and talk about the authentic leadership framework. Now, I'm going to share with you our framework. Um, from my perspective, you may find a different framework or a different set of components that you want to use. I think the only thing I would challenge each of us is to make sure that it represents at least these three major components. The authentic leadership framework that we're using begins with character. Uh, our firm belief is that you lead from the inside out. So who you are matters a great deal more than what you do, at least initially from a leadership perspective. Um, uh, in my introduction, uh, was shared that I've written a book called The Character of Leadership, an Ancient Model for a Quantum Age, which is really around the exploration of the connection between character and leadership. Uh, it's my wholehearted belief that we need a positive, productive, proactive way of talking to leaders about character uh, before we venture anywhere else into the leadership development arena. So I'll share a little bit of what that means in this authentic leadership framework in just a couple of minutes. The other two components are equally as important, but I, I do think follow the development of character. And the next one over is competency. To be an authentic leader, you have to be competent. You have to be capable. You have to be able to demonstrate the behaviors and the skills that go along with effective leadership. Again, you don't have to be perfect, and you don't have to be strong in every aspect of leadership, but you do need to be able to demonstrate a level of competency. And we've given uh, seven um, uh, attributes that we think uh, fit into that category as well. And then finally, the third piece of the framework is around context. Context is everything. Uh, we have today on the webinar, I'm sure, a global audience. And I could offer up a framework 
that works perfectly in North America and doesn't work at all in South America, or doesn't work at, at all in the Middle East, or doesn't work uh, in Europe. And so anything that I'm about to say in terms of authentic leadership always has to be tailored to the context that people are operating in. And again, we've got seven ideas there in that context category that at least you could uh, take a look at and uh, get familiar with and see if, in fact, they'll resonate in your particular area. So the framework for us is the combination or concert of those three components together, character, competency, and context. And how we've chosen to demonstrate this framework is uh, driven by uh, some reading that, that we did uh, a few months ago. Uh, a wonderful book, if you haven't read, I would commend it to you, by Atul Gawande called uh, The Checklist Manifesto. Probably somebody uh, some of you have already uh, digested that writing. It's really an interesting book, and it's actually a book that I uh, thought I should read. That's the reason I read it, not because I was uh, terribly curious about it. I've always been a little bit um, uh, against, I guess, the notion of checklists. Uh, but, but I want to share a story that he shares in the book and then talk about how we've used this checklist idea uh, to try and bring the framework to life in a way that allows you to be a great applier of authentic leadership. So the, the opening of, of his book profiles the development of a new um, bomber in the late 1930s that was to be delivered to the United States Air Force called the B-17 bomber. It was built by Boeing Company and uh, was part of a competitive uh, uh, bidding process that the U.S. Air Force was going through and by all accounts was to be the winning choice. Uh, there were other competitive aircraft, but they were all, quite frankly, uh, smaller, uh, didn't carry nearly as much weight, um, and so the Air Force was going to choose the B-17. But they did have to go through a final test flight in Dayton, Ohio, uh, between all the competitors. And as the B-17 taxied down the runway and took off, uh, just within seconds after takeoff, uh, it turned nose down and crashed into the ground and killed the pilot. And so the competitors uh, took over first place in the competition. Boeing lost out on the bid. Now, the interesting thing about this, um, the headlines in the newspapers uh, said that the B-17 bomber was too much airplane for one man to fly. In other words, it was too complex in those days. I wonder what they would think of today's modern aircraft, but nonetheless, the B-17 uh, was a failure in its test flight. What's interesting is it was still the right airplane, it was still the right design, and the pilot who was behind the controls that day was a highly, highly experienced pilot, but had forgotten a very fundamental item, uh, a particular switch that needed to be flipped on, had not done that, and by the time it was discovered, it was too late to recover. And from that story, um, the modern aircraft checklist was uh, born. And you, I'm sure, all flown many times and have either heard or seen pilots in the flight deck of an airplane going through a checklist. Now, what caught my attention in this story was not just the, the fact that the checklist was born there, but that the checklist as a tool is intended to be in the hands of highly experienced, highly capable people. I had been suffering under the misnomer that a checklist was for somebody that didn't have experience, who didn't know what to do, didn't know, if you, if you will, how to fly an airplane, <clears throat> and consequently they needed a checklist. But Atul Gawande in his book makes the case that it's just the opposite. The checklist is best in the hands of people who are experienced, who have a lot of capability, but who may overvalue their experience and potentially cut corners in any given situation. And the light that went off for us in that discussion about the checklist is, <clears throat> excuse me, what if we brought to, get, well, brought to life this authentic leadership framework in checklist form? Because we use checklists in our daily lives for all sorts of things, right? I've already talked about the fact that they are used in flight, and I'm grateful for that. I travel nearly every week of the year, and so I'm always happy when the pilots go through the checklist and don't skip any steps. Uh, we use them to prepare our foods. Right? We use them in our recipes. Uh, when we go shopping in a supermarket, we usually take a checklist of some sort. Uh, certainly in the medical industry, when surgeries are done, and again, we're grateful for this, that checklists are developed and used by the surgical team. So why not use the checklist as a framework for authentic leadership? The notion being 
that most of us have a pretty good idea of what we're supposed to do, but because of pressures of time and pressures of experience, or because of an overrating potentially sometimes in our own skill, or in some cases an ignorance about what uh, components need to be brought to bear, uh, we are likely to skip a step or two. So with that, what are those three steps to becoming an authentic leader? I think the first one is simple enough, but I'm going to mention it one more time. Step number one is to embrace the authentic leadership framework or some framework like it. This is not intended to be a pitch for that framework alone. It's just the one that I'm most familiar with. You may find other uh, tools that you uh, would use to create authentic leadership. But my, my big pitch is to make sure that you embrace some sort of a framework. Step number two, identify a leadership situation to which you can apply the checklist. This is only going to be valuable work if you can take the items in a checklist and apply them directly to something that's really happening uh, in your organization. And then, of course, the third step would be to do the actual application. So step number one, embrace the framework. Again, I mentioned you may find other frameworks or other components that fit your situation better, and I'm happy to have you uh, do that. Uh, but I do think it's important that you have some sort of a model. E.P. Box, who was a statistician, uh, put it this way. Uh, essentially, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And that's really the goal with any framework, uh, whether it's ours or somebody else's, is that you adopt a way of thinking through situations uh, that helps you think about the constructs of it, but doesn't necessarily give you the answer. And in fact, a checklist is like that. A checklist uh, does not tell you what to do in every particular situation. It is not a step-by-step -step process that you would employ. It's not an algorithm that if you feed in the variables, you're guaranteed to get the right answer. But it is, again, a framework or a model that helps guide a particular uh, way of thinking. So uh, whatever you adopt, I would encourage you to find that model, whether it's this one or something else, that you really can build into your daily leadership activities and, again, doesn't produce the answers for you as much as it produces the right questions. So step number one is embrace the framework. Step number two is to look around your organization and begin to think about where we might apply, uh, what, excuse me, what situations are we facing in which we might need to apply something like the authentic leadership checklist. I've just listed a couple here, but do start to think about what those might be in uh, your organization. Uh, what situations are you facing that you could use uh, a checklist to work through? Here's a couple that have come up to us recently in the work that we're doing. Um, in one of our recent client engagements, uh, they were in need of lowering the turnover rate amongst uh, and the cost of turnover, obviously amongst their entry-level employees. Another one of our clients was pursuing the need to increase sales of a new product line. I'm going to keep the one on turnover uh, going through the rest of our discussion, though, because this was really an interesting one. Um, the organization is a conglomerate, and one of the entities that we've been working with is a hospitality group, uh, lodging, meals, uh, those types of things. And um, the conglomerate leadership, the people at a distance, if you will, the folks from headquarters, um, were very concerned about not only the turnover rate among entry-level positions in this particular company, but obviously the cost that goes along with that. And so we spent some time thinking through how they might lead them through uh, that lowering of a turnover rate and cost amongst their entry-level employees. So I'll uh, use that as an example as we uh, go just a little bit further into the material. So step number two is to identify a leadership situation. Uh, I think that's, well, I don't think, I'm going to say it is one of the most important pieces. Sometimes we fail to pause long enough on the things that are really plaguing our organizations and figure out how to apply a specific model to it. So do think through um, how you would apply the framework. And then step number three is to apply the checklist to your situation. Uh, use the checklist to deal with the root causes. In the checklist, there are three major components. I've already shared those with you. There's 
character, uh, competence, and context. Underneath each of those components, we've identified seven attributes that go with each. So you have 21 different attributes, and I'll walk through those briefly here in just a moment or two. And then within those attributes, we've identified 67 checklist items that you should consider as you apply the checklist to your particular situation. So let's take a look at those components, attributes, and those items. So under the heading of character, I've already told you my bias here, is that character is the center point of an individual's leadership. We've identified seven uh, attributes, excuse me, um, that we believe you should be considering as you apply character to any given situation. I'll just give a very brief description of each one of these values is probably self-evident. Uh, that is the core beliefs of an individual. Uh, equity is uh, doing the right things even when it's costly and difficult. Humility is uh, being personally driven uh, while or professionally driven while being personally humble. Turns out that's a very attractive leadership characteristic. Hope is uh, the ability to dispense hope even in uncertain times. Wisdom is the collective ability and experience of the team and how that's brought to bear in a particular situation. Uh, people is this deep, uh, caring, compassionate concern for individuals before they are units of production. And courage is just exactly what you would think it would be. It's the ability to push past barriers and challenges uh, to achieve a particular goal. So character is going to be uh, part of the checklist. And in fact, um, in some situations, there may be character elements that need to be brought to bear. Now, in competence, you'll see the seven attributes there. The first one, and this is classic in all uh, leadership uh, models, is self-awareness. You have to be aware of your need before you're going to be willing to take up any changes in that. We've also identified communication, oral and written, integrated thinking, the ability about thinking the organization as a whole, problem solving, uh, using a mechanism or a method, if you will, for solving problems, the mixture together of experience um, and education into this thing that we're calling expertise, accountability um, as a component of competence, and strategic focus um, as well. So. Uh, those are the seven attributes under competence. And then context. This is around the organization and how it, uh, how it works, if you will. And direction, we're talking about um, the overall direction of the organization, its values, purpose, vision, and mission. Obviously, the peculiarities of an industry are essentially important to understand if you're going to apply a checklist in a particular situation. If I thought about my, uh, my aircraft example, right, taking off from um, O'Hare International Airport and landing in Heathrow um, are two very different things, although we're flying airplanes in both, right? The context for how those two places work is fundamentally different. Um, and if you expanded that out and said uh, we're going to fly from O'Hare to Beijing, then you'd add some additional complexities of what it would mean to land in a uh, country such as uh, China. So. Um, industry is incredibly important. Of course, leadership is a, a mixture in, in that overall context. Leadership takes lots of different forms depending on what part of the world you are part of, the history of the organization, where it's located, the diversity of its population, the, the diversity of its employee base, and probably all of us have had significant run-ins in our leadership experience uh, over the years with cultures of organizations. Uh, human culture, whether it's in a uh, uh, particular region of the world or a particular organization or even different cultures within the same organization, is an incredibly powerful force. And for those of us that have run headlong into culture, we know that that's something that needs to be contained in our checklist in order for us to be successful. Now, I'm not going to walk through the underlying 67 items that uh, fall under those 21 attributes listed under each of those three pieces. I'm also not suggesting, by the way, that you would necessarily apply every one of those to every situation that you find yourself in. But let's, uh, let's dig down just on one, just so you can see how this application in step three might really work. So I just picked out, um, in, from our, our turnover perspective, a uh, member of the client I mentioned before was suffering from a high turnover in its entry-level positions, and consequently the cost of turnover 
was higher than they wanted it to be. One of the things that we uh, challenged the leader in that situation was to uh, look at their own individual character for a moment. So the component of character, under the heading of values, we have three uh, items that we have listed there. Has this person identified the values that are at play in this situation? Um, has that person determined how to solve the challenge while preserving our or the organization's values? And have I or will I demonstrate my values through both words and actions? So the value at play here was really interesting. Uh, the organization itself really has a value around taking great care of people. And their concern was that their turnover um, might be somehow reflecting that people weren't feeling valued by the organization. So the character piece here was to identify that individual leader's core values and find out and, and ask the hard question, has that leader demonstrated those core values um, in this particular situation? Has that leader demonstrated, said to those people that are in those entry-level uh, roles, we care deeply about you, not only as part of the team, but as individuals and about the families that you have that you're taking care of uh, with your employment here. And it turns out that the employees did not know that. Um, they did not uh, feel particularly valued. They felt like oftentimes entry-level employees do. They felt like they were just part of the overall cog works of the organization and not ne necessarily seen as being critically important. So that's how the checklist drills down. Now, again, in that particular situation, we didn't apply every one of them. We, in fact, just looked at the values under character we looked under competence, how they were communicating and holding people accountable. Uh, that was their managers. Uh, were they being held accountable to standards of how they encouraged uh, and engaged the frontline people? Under context, one of the things that came to bear was um, that the hospitality industry inherently has a high turnover in its frontline positions. So some of what they were experiencing, even though the conglomerate didn't understand it, the people in that particular segment of the conglomerate understood that the industry standards were quite high. They don't have to be satisfied with just hitting those industry standards, but nonetheless, that was the, the case. There also were two other components that came to bear in how they successfully led themselves through the situation. And one of those was the history of the organization itself. It had gone through multiple owners over a very short period of time. So there was a history I would say of uh, distrust or um, mistrust, maybe is a better way to put it. I'm not sure it was completely distrust. Um, but then there were also some cultural aspects. This was in a resort community. This was in a fairly isolated place. And so um, there were some cultural aspects around the culture of the, of the community itself and the culture of the organization. So in that particular case, we used this authentic uh, leadership checklist to check in on the values under character under competence, communication, accountability, under context, um, industry, history, and culture. So that's an idea. Step number three then was how do you apply uh, the checklist itself. Now, if you have an opportunity, and I'll make this available, um, uh, Ollie, to you so that you can distribute to the folks that are on the phone um, after the fact a copy of this checklist that has, again, all of those 67 items listed. It would be uh, too labor intensive to uh, to do that over a webinar, but I would be happy to put that in, in people's hands via PDF and we'll follow up with that right after we finish here so that could be distributed. Um, you may in fact find yourself with a situation as you're thinking through it um, where you need to apply all of the attributes that we've listed out there. Um, they're all very good reminders and prompts. Now the nice thing about a checklist as a way of developing and displaying authenticity it is quick. Uh, it's not a step-by-step -step process. You can quickly go through and say, that pertains, that doesn't pertain, and move through a situation uh, to be successful. So recapping those three steps uh, to becoming an authentic leader, embrace the leadership or the authentic leadership framework or something like it. Again, there's lots of uh, models out there that you could let, grab onto. Just make sure that they have um, from my perspective anyway, those three major components that they touch on character, that they touch on competency, and they touch somehow on the context of the organization. Identify specific situations in your organization with your team that you can apply 
that too. In other words, uh, don't just run around with a checklist in our pockets, but um, what are the situations that we face? What are the opportunities we face where a checklist might be helpful and authenticity to be demonstrated? And then finally, of course, uh, it only works if we actually take the action. Now, recalling where we began, the reason to develop authentic leadership is to engage people in their work because we know that an engaged workforce uh, generates more positive, better results for the organization. So this is not just a feel-good sort of an idea. Becoming an authentic leader is the best possible way to engage your people in the organization, um, and it is the best way to get the best results out of your organization. And with that, I'm going to uh, stop talking and see if any of the participants on the webinar might have a question or two that we could uh, could answer. So I'll come back to you uh, uh, to moderate those questions. If any have come in, that would be great, or I'd be happy to take them live as well. OK, well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Phil, for a very intriguing presentation. And folks, now we are open for the Q&A. So if you have questions, you could either raise your hand uh, once you raise your hand, I'll give you an opportunity to speak to Phil directly, or you could put your questions in the question box. I see there are questions already in the question box, and let me go over straight. We have first one from Dr. Hani Kabil. Um, the question uh, is, is he inserted, uh, is, is touching the hearts and behaving in a polite way with subordinates. <coughs> sorry, may affect the leadership relation between the leader and his team and make him lose the lead due to his amiable way of dealing with stuff? Yeah, so that is, a, that is a fantastic question and it is one of the things that we deal most often uh, with leaders who are venturing into this area. And, and this, this phrase won't quite get to the heart of how we deal with that, but, but let me suggest to you that um, this is the phrase that I open, always open up this conversation with. As a leader, it is very important to get the distance right with your followers. And, and by that I mean um, demonstrating an authentic, genuine concern for them without becoming their best friend. Does that make sense? So, yeah, but, but that distance is hard to manage and, and it takes a little bit of practice. Uh, you can deeply care about that individual without feeling as though you have to take over responsibility for them. Interestingly enough, um, your followers are looking for that genuine demonstration of your care and concern for them, your ability to engage them in a heartfelt way in their work. But they really don't want you to lose your leadership role in that. In other words, they don't want you to lower yourself to the worker level because then they feel uh, uncomfortable that no one is really taking charge of the organization or leading it. So let me give you an example of how you might uh, demonstrate that. At least this is one of the ways that we do it. In fact, I'm going to facilitate a session this afternoon with a client specifically on this. It's an organization that needs to do a restructure. And in that restructuring process, we're going to get lots of people in the room this afternoon that are going to be impacted by the restructure. And I'm going to have the two senior leaders in there with me. And we're going to problem solve through how this uh, restructure should be done. We're going to get as much input as we possibly can from the people that will be impacted. But at the same time, we're going to let them know that they don't get to decide about the restructure, that the leaders will ultimately make the decision. But we're demonstrating a deep care and concern for them as people. We're, we're uh, demonstrating that we understand that this could have even an adverse impact on some of them. But we're not giving up the fact that the leaders are still the leaders and will make the final choices. So we're gathering input in order to make a positive decision. But there is, a, so, so that's an example of how you might engage people in a caring, deep, compassionate way, caring about them first as people before we care about them as units of production in the organization, but without giving up the, the leadership role, so to speak. 
much, uh, uh, Phil. Um, Dr. Henry is also appreciating your answer. We have another one from Sister Sibyl Sahin. Uh, the question is, is it correct that a true leader not only appeals to people's minds, but also to their hearts, as leaders demonstrate through their vision and values? Without question. Uh, and I think I could say this universally. I, I don't, I, I've not traveled as extensively as many on the phone, I'm sure, but but I've been in different parts of the world and I've tested, at least personally, this notion. Human beings are, are driven, are motivated by meaning, right? So to the extent that a leader can not only make a good case for the organization and the various strategies that are put in place, but show how those create meaning for the people in the organization, uh, create meaning for the people who have invested in the organization, you know, those people that put up their capital, and also provide meaning to the community in which they serve and to the customer base, you have the opportunity to capture the whole human being. Now, I'm not suggesting that human beings should find their only meaning in their work. Okay? <laughs> that, would be, uh, that would be ridiculous. I, I think that people have much more diverse and interesting lives than just their work lives. But as a leader in an organization, if you know that human beings are driven by meaning, that's really what gets them up every day, right? That's what has them move through difficulties and adversities. Why wouldn't we as leaders try to capture as much of that and slash provide as much of that meaning as we possibly can in the work that gets done? You see this in nonprofit organizations, right, or uh, non-governmental organizations that operate in different parts of the world. It's clear that those people are driven by a sense of meaning, you know, and that's often in the human aid area. But, but for those of us who operate for-profit organizations that don't find ourselves in those kinds of things, we can create the same type of meaning in those organizations that engages people fully so that they are more successful, their work is more rewarding, and as my case was made earlier, so the organization gets a higher level of success. Okay, um, we have another one, a generic one. Um, uh, how would you define an engaged leader? I know the word engaged is generic, but are there any preferred engaged methodologies that leaders should opt and prioritize? That's a great question. I don't have a I don't have a, a set of tactics uh, that that I would suggest, but but here's here's overall what I would suggest in terms of engagement. Um, it's uh, all of our organizations are have some sort of hierarchical dimension, right? In other words, there's a few people at the top and more at the middle and a lot more down at the bottom. And what happens oftentimes to leaders is because they fit into a hierarchy, they also begin to behave in the hierarchy. And, and so what I would suggest in terms of engagement, it means continually looking for opportunities to come face to face with people in the organization. I realize that's not always possible depending upon the breadth and, and geography of the organization, but somehow come face to face with them. Okay? That is not to undo the hierarchy but that is to find out what's really going on in the hierarchy. So let me give you an example of that. That's, and and it, th these are not new ideas, but they're ones that played out for me. Before this work that I do at Leadership Advisors Group, I spent 17 years in the banking industry. And I had a, an executive assistant in those years um, who was masterful at teaching me how to be an engaged leader. And periodically, and, and this was early on in my career, so I didn't even realize the value of this until it had gone on for some time, but periodically on my schedule, it would say something like, Phil wanders around on the fourth floor. And the first time that appeared on my schedule, I said, well, what is this about? And she said, you know, the people down there just need to kind of hear from you. They haven't seen you in a while. It's a little intimidating coming up the elevator to your office. And so I just scheduled an hour for you to just walk around down there and just chat with people and see how they're doing. And I at first thought that was just a friendly thing. But what I discovered is I learned tremendous amounts about what was actually happening in the organization. And I only learned that directly because I engaged them in their workspace as opposed to in my workspace. So that engagement is, um, is, is contact. Uh, another way I've said it to clients before is that leadership is a contact sport. And if you allow the hierarchy uh, to dictate your um, engagement with people, then information will be inevitably filtered. And that filtering process, oftentimes very important 
things are left out. So I would encourage all of us to think about um, what's ge generally been called um, in the organizational development world leadership by wandering around. And again, it's be, you have to be careful not to undo the, uh, the, the, uh, the role of the people that work for you in management um, and supervisory roles, but nonetheless, engagement really means coming face to face with people in the organization and hearing directly from them their concerns, problems, and even uh, sharing with them their successes. Okay, um, we have a hand raised from uh, Dr. Kabil. Dr. Kabil, I know you've posted your question again, but you've raised your hand. Would you like to speak directly? Uh, yes, of course, if, if, if it is possible. Yes, sir, we can hear you. Could you please introduce yourself and ask a question? Yes, uh, I am Dr. Hani Qabil, the marketing manager uh, in Saudi German Hospital, Medina, TSA. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Fell, for your, this for this wonderful uh, lecture. I, uh, uh, if you allow me, please, I would like to ask about uh, to become a leader in a new organization, uh, which is more better. Uh, from your op opinion, is it uh, is it better to be closed to the old stuff? to know everything uh, about uh, uh, the organization uh, or uh, I have to ignore them and try to collect uh, more information from other ways uh, rather than them. Which is more better? Hmm. Yes. Well, I, I think by definition when you have a new organization, um, you have an incredible opportunity to engage the hearts and minds of those people. Uh, so. Yeah. Uh, again, this is going to be one of those challenges of getting the distance right uh, by, by making sure that you demonstrate ways that you highly value them, um, mm. and, and that's both through words and actions, and yet at the same time, share with them the expectation that some of your engagement could be cut short by your need to gather information from other parts of the organization. One of the, one of the things that, that I'm um, always interested in is yeah. how we can move away from either or thinking to and thinking right yeah. so yeah. Uh, it's much more challenging to think in the and there's a wonderful book written many years ago uh, by Jim Collins and Jerry Porras uh, it's called built to last and yeah. uh, you might know Jim Collins name from the book good to great that's his most famous writing um, yes but um, but his, his first book, Built to Last, they have really interesting chapter titles. And one of the chapter titles amongst these organizations that did well over the long run was this. It was called The Tyranny of the Or, The Genius of the And. And when I'm yes. coaching leaders, in fact, this one I was telling you about in the hospitality industry, we were having uh, almost, a, almost a debate. He said, I said, I want you to engage in a much more meaningful way with your employees. And he goes, well, I don't really have time for that. I have a yeah. business to run. I said, I want you to do both. I, I want you to run the business, and I want you to engage with them. Now, you can mix those two things together, right? So just like my, my decision-making story, um, we're uh, the, the one we're going to have this afternoon, we're going to reorganize the organization. So we're going to do the work, but we're also going to demonstrate at the same time our concern for them as people. So the challenge, mm -hmm. I think, if you can find these is to see, is there an opportunity to do both at the same time? Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Fed. You're very welcome. Thank you for the question. Thanks for taking your time today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kabel. Um, and folks, that uh, really brings us towards the end of the webinar. With that note, I would like to thank uh, Phil Eastman for a very wonderful presentation that you've given on behalf of Maid. Phil, any concluding remarks that you have before we dismiss out? Well, I just want to thank you for the opportunity. What an honor to uh, to uh, to speak with you today and to uh, to address your group in different parts of the world. Uh, this is something that uh, that I take very seriously, and I take the responsibility of trying to uh, dispense some some good information, some good ideas. So um, I would just uh, say in conclusion that um, if uh, we can be of any help to anyone um, with some resources that we have at our disposal, please let us know, and I will. Uh, make sure that we get a copy of that checklist over to you so that you can distribute that to the listeners as well.
Thank you very much, Phil. Certainly, I mean, the feelings are mutual, and we look forward to remaining engaged with you. And uh, folks, all of you who participated in this webinar and made it an interactive experience for all of us, thank you very much. Uh, we are recording this webinar, and we'll be uploading it on Mile Community, which is community.mile.org. Uh, we would also seek uh, Phil's interest to join the community and remain accessible to all of you. So please stay tuned to the community.mile.org. With that note, I would like to end this webinar so you all will be automatically dismissed out. Thank you very much. Wassalamu